Good morning. Can we do better than that? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Washburn University and the 2022 Michael Tilford Conference on Diversity and Multiculturalism. I'm Danielle Dempsey Swopes. I'm the Director of University, Diversity and Inclusion at Washburn University. And I can't tell you how excited I have been to allow Washburn to be your host for our 2022 Michael Tilford Conference on Diversity and Multiculturalism. We are ready to get started with our morning program. We have a welcome from Dr. Laura Stevenson our Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, again, I wanna say welcome to Washburn and welcome to the Michael Tilford Conference on Diversity and Multi Multiculturalism. Uh, on behalf of Washburn, I just wanna say how honored we are to host this event. Uh, I think this is a really important event for Kansas, for higher education in Kansas. And um, I think that Topeka and Washburn are particularly appropriate places to host this event. And I, and I wanna explain why. And uh, I'm gonna just mention last week, I, I was driving home and I was listening to Kansas Public Radio and my least favorite part of Kansas Public Radio is the Fun Drive. And I, but I'm actually gonna quote something from the Fun Drive for you, and I'm not even gonna ask you to give money, although giving money to Public Radio was a really good thing. Um, but they were, uh, Kevin Wilmot was helping out with the Fun Drive, and Kevin Wilmot is a KU film professor, a filmmaker, uh, an Oscar winner, uh, I'm a fan. Um, and he was helping with the Pledge Drive, and the interviewer asked him, you know, what about his notion of home? And, you know, and again, he lives in Lawrence. He's, he's a lifelong Kansan. And he commented that one of the things he liked about living in Kansas and in Lawrence was the concept of the noble narrative. And he, you know, he explained that as, you know, Kansas was a free state, you know, we were on the good side. You know, Lawrence was the, you know, the hotbed for uh, the, uh, the abolitionists and, um, and that these are noble stories and that these, being a part of these stories and feeling like we're a part of that narrative can inspire and give us something to aspire to. Not that we, you know, always reach those ideal values, but those are part of our heritage, part of our narrative. And, I, and that really resonated with me. And I think about Topeka, you know, home of Brown v. Board and, you know, the theme of this conference, not turning back. Um, and I also think about Washburn. And you may not be as familiar with Washburn's noble narrative, but I, I just wanted to, to share this with you um, since you're on campus today. And Washburn was founded in eight, 1865 by East Coast abolitionists who wanted to provide higher education to people who had not had access to higher education. And specifically, they wanted to provide education to formerly enslaved people, to women, and to people without financial means. Uh, it was originally named Lincoln College in honor of, of Abraham Lincoln. And very early on, it ran into financial problems. And an East Coast abolitionist who had never been to Kansas uh, was solicited to see, would you support this, um, this institution? And he was the owner of a wire factory in Worcester, Massachusetts. He donated $25,000 to the university and saved it. And it, be, it was renamed Washburn College in his honor. Uh, again, this was somebody who believed in that noble narrative of higher education and, and access to higher education. Early on in its, again, in its beginnings, as they opened the door to people who had not had access to 
uh, higher ed, they also discovered these were the same people who had not had access to quality secondary ed or prep. And so some of the first classes at Washburn were preparatory classes to prepare people for secondary, uh, for secondary ed, and, uh, excuse me, for higher ed. And again, this was part of Washburn's commitment to access. Uh, our, our, um, so as you, as you walk across campus today, you're going to see uh, sculptures of Ichabod Washburn and you'll see the mascot around. And uh, again, this is our tribute to the man who um, believed in a noble narrative and saved the university. Our, our motto here at Washburn is non nobis salome, not for ourselves alone. I know that many of you are here today because you hold close to your hearts, noble narratives as well. Uh, and those can be narratives that include things like equity, diversity, inclusive, inclusivity, and the value of higher education for all. I thank you for your commitment and your work to promote those values. This is hard work. It's ongoing work. And as the theme of this conference this year is, there's no turning back. Um, but it's not work that you should be doing on your own. And I would urge you and hope that you will find today inspiration, support, ideas for all the work that you're doing, that, and you can carry those ideas back to your institutions. Thank you all for putting together Danielle and her group and all of the, you, the presenters today for putting together a fabulous program. I, it looks very exciting to me. I, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. We also have a welcome from Dr. Blake Flanders. He's the CEO of the Kansas Board of Regents. I'm never sure if my knee's going to allow me to make that step. <laughs> There's actually some differences there. So uh, thank you on behalf of the Board of Regents. Welcome uh, to the conference. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you today. <clears throat> uh, I tell you, the positive messaging now is over. So, <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what the board's doing. It's hard work. We've looked. We've got tremendous gaps. There's gaps of opportunity for Hispanics, for African Americans, for students in poverty, for rural students. A couple, two, three years ago, we'd, we'd worked with the diversity officers for years. Marche and I got together, Marche, if you haven't met her, and we said, what are we gonna do to move the needle? Like we're doing a lot of good work. We have a lot of good programming. Would you all agree we, we have some good programming? But, right? But every year the numbers aren't moving. I mean, I've just got to be a truth teller and tell you we've got to move these numbers. It, it, uh, these numbers are people and our system was just candidly not designed to serve them. It just was not. And so uh, the board said, we've gotta, we've gotta make a change here. We've gotta make a change in what we're doing and we gotta make a change structurally. And we brought in, we said, is there any institution that's had any success out there? Is there just one? I'm kind of tired of hearing about them, honestly, because there, there is just, there was one that we found, and that was at Georgia State University, and they elevated every population group and fundamentally increased graduation rates, uh, and there were not differences now uh, between those groups. And so uh, in higher ed, what did we do? We said, well, maybe we ought to talk to them. We brought them in, the president came, virtually, it was during the COVID year, to the, to the board, uh, and we talked to them, and they had a National Institute of Student Success. We brought them in, we did some inventories, 
and some gap analysis with our state universities. We're beginning to do that work. We've done it with one community college. We, we're beginning to do that work with Washburn and the other community colleges and technical colleges. And they looked at our practices. And so, and they developed these playbooks. So what I, uh, so I challenge you today, and I thank you for uh, all your work, that we have got to get way beyond access. You know, we always talk about access. It's important, isn't it? You know, but access is the lowest bar imaginable. I mean, it is like down here. So, you know, access can be a problem. Is it good to have access and have people take out loans and then drop out after a year and a half? It happens all the time. So I'm all about access, but if I hear a lot of talk about access without success quickly following, I get a little nervous, right? I hope you do too. So I, I wanted to just challenge you to go back to your institution if you would help me, and, I'll, and I will partner with you. If you find things, you call us directly. We want to help you, okay? Your institutions, every one of them is going to say, we care about this work. Every one of them, right? We all say it. We've been saying it for years. Generally, here's how we measure success. I'm just going to be honest with you. We say, we've hired a chief diversity officer. Okay, we're done now, right? Is that... Is that kind of nationally what the trend has been? Yes, and the numbers don't move, right? They don't move. So go back to your institutions. I've looked at some of these areas where we need to change our practice. How many are at a community college? Anybody from a community college? Good, good. I, if your community college has not moved to co-requisite remediation, then the community college does not really value student success because that model has been proven that it works and we have to move to it. If you're at a community college or a university and you're not offering tutoring to students that are in credit-bearing classes, then you can say you care about student success. You really don't have the will to change it. If your institution has barriers set up to articulation, if you kind of try to wheedle some students out of credits when they transfer, you know, look at, look at the students transferring. Go back, look, see how many are losing credits. If there's a lot of them, then the institution really doesn't value student success because that's why Many people drop out, they, they transfer, they said, oh dear, I've lost a lot of credits, I've already paid for these. They become discouraged and they drop out, okay? So all the, if your institution hasn't identified the DFW courses, where are students having trouble? Where are the sticking spots? And then how are we going to intervene? And how are we going to use data to make sure that we find those students early? then you're going to continue to have these equity gaps. So I'm asking you to go back and look for that. If your institution has not moved to centralized professional advising, students need professional advisors. If you haven't, then you're not following the proven practice and your dropout rate, and it's going to continue. If you don't have an emergency loan mechanism set up, we have students dropping out as juniors that need $200. They need $50. They need $100. Georgia State found it very effective. If you haven't set that up, then you're going to, uh, then, then the numbers probably aren't going to move. We need to also create meta-majors for our students. Sometimes they don't exactly know what they want to be. They've got to be able to move between majors, majors so that they don't lose credits early on. 
So I, I challenge you to go back to your institutions. The Board of Regents, we want to be your full partner. We want to, you know what, you may not have all these things in place. We got to get them in place. We don't have time to wait. It really is one of the, the most critical things for the future, not only of individuals, but of the entire state of Kansas. So thank you again for attending the conference, uh, and I appreciate all your hard work. Thank you very much, Dr. Flanders. We accept the challenge, do we not? Yes. We do. So we're ready to move on with our program, but I wanted to just take a moment to give you a few housekeeping items. So make sure that you can connect to the Washburn University Wi-Fi and that you can access the conference program. You can access it through the QR code. I'll give you a second if you need the code that's on the screen. We've also got handouts outside at the registration table with the QR code so that you can access the full agenda. We also have some instructions for connection to Wi-Fi. So if you haven't seen those, those instructions are also outside on the registration table. And lastly, if you have any question, any concern, any issue at all, there are several wonderful, wonderful Washburn colleagues around the room. We've all got Washburn name tags on. Please don't hesitate to ask one of us any questions or to ask at the registration table. Okay, are we ready? We have one of Washburn's bestest and brightest students here to introduce our first keynote speaker. So start walking this way. Miss Anaya Williams. She is vice president of Washburn University's Black Student Union. Good morning, everyone. Okay, bear with me, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Dr. Alex Redcorn is a citizen of the Osage Nation. In the, in the College Education in, of Kansas State University, he serves as the Assistant Professor in Educational Leadership, Coordinator of Indig ooh, sorry, Indigenous Partnership, Co-Chair of Indigenous Faculty and Staff Alliance, Executive Director of Kansas Association of Native American Education and Program Coordinator for Indigenous Educational Leadership Graduate Certificate. His scholarship and service are focused on building capital, capital capacities of Native nations to take on a more pro prominent role in education and their citizens. As a member of college, of the college and education facility, Dr. Redcorn has consulted, consulted with schools and tribal leaders across the regional region of various topics related to education of indigenous people. He also has also developed a new indigenous educational leadership graduate certificate program, as well as as well as partnership programs with the Osage Nation that has graduated two cohorts of Osage leaders and master's degree in educational leadership. Addition, additionally, Dr. Redcorn teaches courses in equality research methods, specializing in critical indigenous approach to research and auto-ethnic auto pro uh, research. All right, I have to set a timer to keep myself organized here. All right, so uh, 
Hawaii. My name is Alex Redcorn. Um, I'm a, as you said, I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation, and uh, my family is from the Oaxacolin District of the Osage Nation, uh, which is near Pahuska, Oklahoma. For anybody that knows, um, and just the Pioneer Woman's Mercantile isn't the only thing that's in Pahuska, Oklahoma. It's also capital and headquarters of the Osage Nation. So, um, but I'm from the Tsejuwash Target Clan, which is a peacekeeper clan. Um, I really appreciate the invite to be here today and to talk about land acknowledgements and going beyond land acknowledgements, especially since these have become very um, kind of routine practices in our institutions. Well, some more than others, but um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and just let's let's go with this. It's it's this conference is going. Let's let's get it going here. All right. So and is the technology going to work? Maybe it's a there we go. And uh, so who am I? So I talked about Osage Citizen and those little boxes there because we transferred a PowerPoint from one computer to another. And that's the new Osage orthography that's only brand new. And so it's just now on digital platforms. And so uh, that says Tsejuwashtagi and that says Wahakulin. But I started out as a social studies teacher. Um, and I'm from Kansas State University right now, um, but I, if, if it's okay to say, I got my first two degrees at the University of Kansas. And uh, it's fun year, all right? And, and my family's from Oklahoma, so there's that, all right. So, um, but, so I, I got my, so I got my first two degrees in social studies curriculum instruction at Kansas University, and then I got my doctorate in ed leadership at K-State. But at those, uh, at K-State, I specialize in indigenous perspectives in education. And that's my family, um, my son Carter, daughter Autumn, and wife Erica. So um, I like to joke around. I have to put these pictures up there because that way people know I'm a real Indian, all right? Because these are the images, these are the images that people most associate, all right? And hopefully the technology will keep working. Maybe we'll just do the manual. Yeah, can you go to the next slide? All right, so the main questions for today, or the main questions we kind of like to contemplate is, whose land are we on? And it's incredible how many people can walk across their lands and not actually know whose land you're on, um, who are the original inhabitants of your land. But I also want to talk about what goes into a land acknowledgement and what's the point. So if we're going to do land acknowledgements, um, I think they're a good thing. There's a lot of people that can be critical of them, but if we're going to do land acknowledgements, if we don't actually take it another step further, what's the point? And so that's a little bit what I'll talk about today. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. So I always like to uh, put people on the spot and let them know, remember I'm a social studies teacher, um, how many states are in the United States and how many original colonies? and people are singing in their head 50 nifty united states all right so that's a very common knowledge very basic knowledge it's not complicated you got that in elementary school along with the song so the next question is how many federally recognized tribes are in the united states there's going to be like three people in here like i know this uh close that was an old number so it's 574 federally recognized tribes so I have people in here. I've done this enough. I know where the numbers are at in your head. They're anywhere from like 10 to 700. And a lot of people are in the uh, 10 to 200 range probably. Um, so how many federally recognized tribes are in the state of Kansas? Okay, we got more people. In, I'm assuming they might be from Northeast Kansas. But so these fundamental things, a lot of people don't know. We know 50 nifty United States and 13 original colonies, but we don't even tend to know the basic fundamental of how many tribes are in the United States. So this is what land acknowledgements help us do. They help us think about these things and they're basic learning tools. So it's a basic learning tool to learn about the history of Kansas. And it's not just, hey, we need an apology for all this stuff. It's just a basic learning tool. Like, hey, we're a learning institution, so how can we help people learn the history of this area? And if you're thinking about writing a land acknowledgement or you've had trouble in figuring out where do we start with the land acknowledgement, you got a QR code up there. We just now created a toolkit from the Kansas Association for Native American Education to help people with that. On one hand, it's because we got a lot of emails asking, how do we do this? 
And so we created a toolkit. It's posted online on our website, which uh, Con AE is hosted by K-State. So it's on the K-State website. So if you want, I'm actually going to walk through some of the things, the short version of what's in there. But um, that's basically there for you to help you um, walk through what does that process look like. And in Kansas, you might be in the state that has the most complicated land acknowledgments in the rest of the country because so many tribes were moved through the state of Kansas and we were Indian territory and then we decided, and when I say we, the state of Kansas and Eurocentric we, spoiler alert, I'm also white, um, but basically they, they needed room, make room for Kansas to become a state. So they moved a lot of tribes to Oklahoma, including my ancestors, my non-white ancestors. So. Four essential components to a land acknowledgement, and this is in that toolkit. Number one, acknowledge ancestral homelands. That one's easy. All right. So, well, it, it's the easy, one of the easier parts. All right. So uh, there's some there's some anybody who wants to update these maps. Um, this is really a needed thing. But um, Pawnee, Kansa, Osage of the Kaw, the state of Kansas was named after the Kaw Kansa people. We all actually have a lot of students entering. We actually have a lot of students entering your institutions that don't know that basic fact, the Kaw River. Um, you have Osage County, you have Shawnee County, you have these names everywhere. Um, so, well, the Shawnees were moved through, I'll get that. But out in the Western Plains, you also have the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowas, and Comanches. And so, who were the original people? And then you have this other, oh, and if you look at Osage and Kaw land sessions, putting these maps attached to your land acknowledgements is also an opportunity for you. Um, so if you look over here, and I don't know if this is going to laser point. Oh, no, that's all right. So if you look, those are like two, two different maps, but those are puzzle pieces. If you look at the cost land session map on the southern end, that fits with the Osage land session map on the right. And so those are the land sessions. Um, it was call land and Osage land on this half of the state, basically. And if you get up near Nebraska, it was Pawnee land. So just getting these learning tools in front of our students with the land acknowledgement is also preferred. We also have tools uh, that are being developed with the Kaw Treaty Project at Kansas State University, and this is in collaboration with the Kaw Nation. Yes, the Kaw Nation still exists, all right? A lot of people do not know that the Kaw people still exist. They're just across the border in Oklahoma because they were forcibly removed. So the Kaw Nation, and if you wanna engage in hyperlink to learning tools, because we're on Kaw historic land right now, that Kaw Treaty Project at Kansas State University is an opportunity to hyperlink if you're gonna post a land acknowledgement somewhere. So these are the projects, and that's done in collaboration with Kaw people, all right? So getting context around those, those primary sources and engaging with that community is an important part of the process. So I call this colonial lasagna in Kansas. We got the tribes that were here first, and then we have the tribes that were forcibly moved through, creating this other layer of a land acknowledgement. And these tribes will even tell you, well, we're not from Kansas, so sometimes they're like, I don't need to be in your land acknowledgement, and that, yeah, that might be the case. But we like to, to teach this history, we have to engage in that colonial lasagna and say, there are also tribes that move through. So if you look up there in the upper right, basically you're near the intersect, we're in Shawnee County, and if you go down the road, you have Shawnee Mission Schools in the city of Shawnee. When I say down the road, down I-70. And that's Shawnee history. And just north there, the Wyandots were there, Wyandot County. And so we're at this confluence of where there were Wyandots, Shawnees, and Kaws um, at one particular time, originally being Kaw land. And basically, they took the Kaw land and gave it to the Shawnees and Wyandots. So um, this is a complicated layer that we need to address in a land acknowledgment. And we have to acknowledge that a Google map image that you put on there disappears when you're in the middle of your presentation, but all of the other images are still up there. And we have four tribes, just picture an upper northeast corner of um, Kansas. The four tribes of Kansas are in northeastern Kansas. Uh, the Prairie Bands, the Kansas Kickapoos, um, the Iowa tribe, and the Sac and Fox Nation. Of the, um, and a lot of those, what you have to know is every single one of those tribes, Sac and Fox, Iowas, Kickapoos, and Prairie Band, or Potawatomis, all have relatives that are in other states that are also federally recognized tribes because they were broken up through the settler colonial process. We all inherited these histories. We didn't ask for them, but we did inherit them. 
And so helping these land acknowledgements help us understand why you see prairie band Potawatomis, and then you go to Oklahoma and you see citizen band Potawatomis, and then you go up toward the Great Lakes and see other Potawatomis as well. Oh, there it is. It was animated for some reason. All right. So, but we also have to recognize that American Indian, American Indians are not just near the reservations and on the reservations. They're in all your institutions. This is um, a map of enrollments in every school district in the state of Kansas for American Indians. So we can't just think, oh, land acknowledgements, that's for the Indians that are over there in that part of the state. We don't have to worry about that. No, they're all over our state. And that was through forcible removal. And what the easy thing to understand is they were removed to reservations. What a lot of people don't know is then they had federal policies that moved into them into urban areas and other areas trying to eradicate the, nation, the native nation status altogether. So these are the things you learn when you bring in land acknowledgements. So we brought in a land acknowledgement that tried to acknowledge at K-State, we tried to acknowledge those layers of that. Um, and uh, we try to be as inclusive as possible because our name, Kansas State University, is really representing an entire state in a way. Um, and so our local version of it's really a lot more broad than some of your local versions would be. So when you do land acknowledgements, try to be as local as possible and specific to the locale as possible. So um, this media wasn't working when we were over here, but basically we tried to make um, our native students visible. And so we wrote that land acknowledgement as a group, as the Indigenous Faculty Staff Alliance on campus, and then our students were able to record it. So then all of a sudden, every event when people do a land acknowledgement, you make your native students visible um, in the recitation of the land acknowledgement. So that's something that we were really happy about. So this fourth thing, this is the thing we, we don't, we haven't listed at, or we haven't done it at K-State yet, but we're doing stuff to work on this. Um, and actually I credit KU has been trying to be intentional about process with the whole land acknowledgement piece. So, so when you have these land acknowledgements, we just covered the first three things of the basic fundamental stuff. The fourth thing is where the work actually is. So what do you want to accomplish if you do a land acknowledgement? Do you actually want to improve learning for, about, and with indigenous peoples and nations, or are you just trying to check a diversity box? Because your land acknowledgement won't be as productive as you, th as you think on the diversity front if you don't address this fourth item. And how can we move beyond land acknowledgements as performativity? So the last thing is you have to turn land acknowledgements into action. To go beyond land acknowledgements and make them, to make them meaningful, we need to have action to go with it. Because everybody at every institution in this state is benefiting from the land dispossession. Every single institution is on native land. So let's do a real quick Indian Ed 101 background. So Indian, Indian Education and Tribal Sovereignty 101. So native nations existed long before Europeans arrived. And they had educational systems, and you might go to a powwow or see some things, and they say, oh, our traditions and ceremonies, those are educational systems. Those are institutions of education that don't have necessarily the same type of look that we have in these classrooms across this campus. So Native nations had systems of education long before they arrived. And the Civilization Fund Act in 1819 started to move, to move towards this idea that we need to get rid of the Indian and, and keep the man, all right? And I'll have some stuff on that in a second, but the uh, this is the beginning of assimilation was the goal for education in the American Indian. Assimilation to whiteness and Christianity was the primary goal. And I argued that it may be harder to see, but that goal has not stopped. That trajectory has not stopped. The quick version with too many words on the slide is native nations are domestic dependent nations and there are legal foundations for this. They have inherent rights to sovereignty. The federal government has acknowledged those rights because the fact that they engaged with native nations in the first place acknowledged this is another institution that has their own sovereignty and the act of treaty making acknowledges that. So the federal government has a responsibility for native nations. So the federal government decided, all right, Let's set up some boarding schools, all right? This was their version of education in the beginning. And the Haskell Indian Nations University just down the road here, which a lot of people don't even really know or understand, they just see it on the road when they're coming in and out of Lawrence. It started out as this kill the Indian, save the man approach to education. So 
Higher education institutions were originally weapons of colonization. They were weapons. And that's the foundation of our infrastructures. That's the foundation of the curricular decisions that still are alive. That's the foundation of how we name programs. That's the foundation of all these things. It was meant to create a place for settlers to come in, get their education, set down roots, and stay and never leave. That was stage two of the after land removal. So the Dawes Act then started pulling all this land. So they moved to reservations, but then they actually started making tribes break apart their reservations and into allotments, all right? And um, if anybody wants to hear the Osage version of this, our final removal from Kansas, if anybody's got a long drive on the way back, that In Trust podcast um, looks at that and actually looks at Reed Drummond, the pioneer woman, and her family's attachment because Reed Drummond's married into a family that has a lot of Osage land um, in Osage County, former Osage reservation. So that's a long, complicated story that we don't really have a whole semester's worth to unpack that. But this land grant tradition, we have to acknowledge. We have to start thinking about it. We have to be critical about these things. And we have to just confront the truth of how these things happen. And I'm at Kansas State University, and we proudly tout our land grant history. Well. There's a database from the High Country News that's kind of really brought light to this, or it's Land Grab. So Land Grab Universities is an article out of the, um, this publication, and if you go in there, it's not just a story, it's a whole database. You can click on every single land grant institution, and you can see exactly where the parcels of land came from and exactly which treaties ceased that, or were the sessions of that land, and sometimes those sessions weren't entirely as simple as, oh, we gladly see this land. So these histories follow us around, and those are the parcels of land that went to land-grant institutions so they could become the financial foundation for land-grant systems. Kansas State University, you can go in that database, and you can see these are all the parcels of land that fed the founding of Kansas State University. You can go into Mizzou. You can go look at Mizzou. Osage land fed the founding of Mizzou. Call land entirely. Kaw Nation, their land fed the founding of Kansas State University. And more. Kaw land also went up back to a whole bunch of universities on the East Coast to found their universities. So that's all Kaw land going back and funneling back to the East Coast. So these are our realities. This is the foundation of our systems. And when was KU founded? So you go on the site and you get the whole seal 1865 and then 1866. But for the most part, the founding of Kansas State, 1861, the founding of K State, 1863, the founding of KU, 1865. But a lot of people don't see right next to that call removal, 1859 and 1860, Osage removal, 1865, 1872. It's the same era. And Little House on the Prairie. And I, I'm sorry, Little House on the Prairie is the story of removal of my ancestors. That's Osage removal in southern Kansas to Oklahoma, where we, bought our, we had to buy our own land back. So these stories are alive in our systems. And basically, the relationship between land dispossession and higher education and education in general of American Indians are inherently tied together. Their histories are inter interwoven and you can't separate them. So land in the United States plus educational systems is what I like, a phrase I like to use from an Osage anthropologist. It's a colonial entanglement. And I always say we have to confront these colonial entanglements. These are colonial entanglements that we inherited. We all inherited them. We didn't necessarily ask for them, but we got them. They fell in our lap. So what do we do with them as we move forward? So the critical questions, which I'll skip to the next thing, is most of our students, most of Native students, people think they're at Haskell Indian Nations University. That is a small college that does have 100% Native students, and they do great things for culture, cultural learning and cultural responsivity. But most Native students are in state institutions and community colleges. So, our local governance structures and our state institutions actually have responsibility, even though the federal government has the trust responsibility, and they're the ones that removed them. 
So we have to ask critical questions, like do our students have access to their native languages in our institutions? How much do our students learn about the basics of tribal sovereignty? How, do, how much do our students have access to native teachers and professors? How are our students invisible in our institutions? And how much do teachers, professors, and leaders know about the multiplicity of programs and laws stemming from the federal trust responsibility? For how many people in here is the, the word federal trust responsibility, how many people, that's a new term to them? It's the foundation of legal Indian, or, uh, tribal nations legal status. And so getting to know, that's why NAGPRA exists, Native American Graves and Repatriation Act. That's why Haskell exists. That's why all these things exist. So beyond land acknowledgments is educating ourselves about this, all this stuff. So I'm going to move forward. So key considerations for action. Building reciprocal relationships with Native nations. And I will say, if everybody in here went and emailed all the, all the four tribes to tomorrow, that's going to be a bit much, all right? But thinking long term about how you can build relationships specifically with the tribes that are most relevant to your locale um, is an important first step. Um, creating positions for tribal liaisons. Um, oh, do your homework first. Don't put all the labor on them. Come tell me all about you. Okay, well, we got a whole bunch of other people that just emailed me, all right? So um, create positions for tribal liaisons within an admin. Build relationships before you ask somebody if they want to join a grant effort with you. That's a very important thing. And engage in listening sessions, create infrastructures for co-governance. We're actually working on this at the state level to a degree. We have a new group called the Kansas Advisory Council for Indigenous Education. And we have a cable representative and a Kansas Board of Education representative and a Kansas State Department of Ed person in the same room as tribal leaders in the state. So we have these things kind of brewing that's brand new. Um, and explore ways that mainstream curricular infrastructures need to be adapted to meet the needs of Native nations. So we need to prepare students to understand they're going to have to interact with some of these nations. They're going to have to interact with some of these kids. So tribal education departments in general are very interested in higher education. And I've done a survey from tribal ed departments. And higher ed is one of the main, higher ed student support is one of the main things they do. But we have to make sure we understand that if our, if our students come and say, I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation, you need to know the Osage Nation Education Department has support services for you. So they also, these tribal education departments, are very interested in partnering with colleges. They do so at an alarming rate. Not alarming, that's not the right word. <laughs> they do so at a, really, at a really high rate. So a lot of tribal ed departments are used to partnering with tribes or are interested in partnering with institutions of higher education. How do we ensure that relationships are in place so headlines like these don't happen? Our institutional museums are not the graveyards for Native nations. So we need to think about these things and think about the long-term impacts of relationship building. When you look at data, key considerations is Native Americans get lost in the data. So if you look at this, um, the middle column, the one with the 1,000s, are the number of Native students who checked only American Indian Alaska Native. That's the only thing they checked. So you have 1,500 in 2021. But then you see Native Americans who also checked another race, all of a sudden you have 4,332. They're not on any of the reports. So on the, at the K through 12 level, we found that 63% of Native students are lost in multiracial. So any reporting that says, here's how American Indian students are doing are actually mix, missing around 63%. And that's not including the Hispanic layer. And you have this growing number of students who are checking American and Alaska Native, but also checking Hispanic. And um, a recent visit to Southwest Kansas, they talked about a lot of students coming from um, Guatemala are coming with Spanish as their second language and an indigenous dialect out of Central and Latin America. So we have to understand these things. We have to understand that they're lost in our data. This is uh, what happens on the left when you have American Indians, Alaska Natives alone. So that's when they choose only American and Alaska Native. But on the right is what happens when you see the density of populations when you also look for students who checked American Indian, Alaska Native and white. So 
We can't also forget that this is what happens when you see students who chose American, Alaska, Native, and Black. So our students don't look like the stereotype that a lot of people think of, all right? So trying to move towards a close here is that we have to think about ways to move beyond American Indian multicultural responsiveness as like this add-on. We have our powwow, we get our pictures, we post it up, and that's great. That is good. But what about what's going on inside the classrooms, inside their program of study every single day, every single semester? Because that's where you can actually start moving these things at a lot more degree. Dr. Flanders said, we're not moving the needle. Well, we're just doing these add-on things for diversity instead of embedding it inside the, for the deeper institution. And we also have to think about, have Native nations already paid their land tax? If we have in-state tuition, based on the logic that we have Kansas residents who are paying taxes and paying their dues, and then you have out-of-state people who are not, things like that, American Indians used to have all this land. And it was their land that went to founding these institutions. So we have barriers to tuition, but should we? What's the logic in that? We have other states that are doing this, all right? California, Arizona, Michigan, they all have ways to break down those barriers. We have tuition waivers for American Indian students. And so with that, I'll close. Um, and this, uh, later this afternoon at four o'clock, I have a session um, where we'll have a more intimate kind of environment where we can talk over all these things. It'll be, a, I'll, I'll quickly refresh some of these topics and we'll dialogue about them. People can ask questions and things like that. So four o'clock, we'll, we can talk about these topics in a, in a session that I'll be hosting later. And uh, Wei Wina, thank you very much for um, having me here and appreciate it. Is that an amazing way to start our day or what? Thank you very much, Dr. Redcorn. I always learn a lot when you're in the room. So we're ready for our next keynote address from Dr. Royal Johnson. But here to introduce him is another one of Washburn's best and brightest, our Washburn University student government president, Shaden Haynes. All righty, so Dr. Royal M. Johnson is an associate professor of the higher education with tenure in Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California. He is also the director of student engagement in the USC Race and Equity Center and a faculty member in the Polius Center for Higher Education. Prior to joining USC, he was on faculty senate at Penn State, where he was the associate director of the Center for the Study of Higher Education. Dr. Josh Johnson is a nationally recognized expert on the issues of educational access, racial equity, and student success. His work has been an unapologetic force on the black and institutionally marginalized populations like those impacted by criminal punishment, child welfare, and inequitable education systems. He has published more than 60 academic publications, including peer-reviewed articles in the Journal of Higher Education, Journal of College Student Development, and Peabody Journal of Education and Teachers College Record. In 2022, Dr. Johnson published two books, Racial Equity on College Campuses, Connecting Research and Practice, and Enacting Student Success, Critical and Alternative per per Perspectives on for Practice. His work has been supported by grants and contracts from the Spencer Foundation, Institution of Education Sciences, and Department of Health and Human Services, totaling over $5.1 mil $5 million. 
For his career achievements, he was awarded the 2022 Distinguished Young Alumni Award from the University of Illinois, the 2020 Emerging Scholar Award, and the 2022 Outstanding Contribution to the Multicultural Education and Research Award from the ACPA, and the 2022 AERA Division G Early Career Award. Dr. Johnson is a two-time graduate from the University of Illinois at where he earned his BA in political science and an EDM in educational political studies. He earned his PhD in higher education and student affairs um, and specifically with race and social policy from the Ohio State University. Let's please welcome Dr. M. Johnson. Be one second to get set up. Testing, testing, testing. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's actually back feeding. Let me just use. Testing, testing, here we go. Good morning. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. I wanna first appreciate Danielle for all of her work uh, and the invitation and bringing me here. Can we appreciate her and her team with a round of applause? Thank you so much. Uh, I also want to recognize and appreciate all the custodial staff, the tech staff who are working behind the scenes to bring to us a really ho hopefully an uncomplicated experience. So obviously, I was excited to get this invitation, not only because it's Topeka, Kansas, the home of the legendary Brown v. Board decision, uh, but the work of the conference aligns with that of what I've been doing for uh, nearly a decade now. And so I'm honored to be here uh, and to share some of the work um, that, that I'm referenced. So in the time that we have, I want to talk a little bit about a concept that I think has enormous implications for the success of students. That is sense of belonging. I've seen the conference program already. I see that there are some coverage of this topic already. I've had some good conversations with folks, but I wanna talk a little bit about what it means, and more importantly, what it means to accept personal and institutional responsibility for the success of our students and making sure that they have equitable opportunities to experience belonging. So let me make sure this works. So I like to start these talks off with a few caveats, the first of which is that I hate the term or idea of best practices. I know that folks, come to conferences like this ready to learn as much as they can and go back and implement immediately to see immediate outcomes. It doesn't happen like that, right? Um, the idea of best practices sort of presupposes that there is a universal set of approaches uh, that hold up irrespective of context. And we know that that's just not the case, that context is important, identity is important. So what I wanna do in this session is introduce you to some ideas, uh, an equity mindset, uh, some perspectives, some promising practices that I hope expand your proverbial toolkit of resources and strategies that you can go back and deploy to be the best uh, educators. Uh, so just to reframe from moving away from best practices to best educators, how do we equip ourselves with that? Uh, so there are other few things that I want to acknowledge at the onset about predominantly white institutions. How many of you work at l predominantly white institutions, right? Most of us. Uh, so many of you have likely heard the phrase or saying that college and universities are like a microcosm, right? Um, to some extent, that's true. While many of our universities don't reflect the vast racial ethnic diversity of our country, uh, there are in fact similar systems of oppression that operate, whether it be racism, sexism, heterosexism, transphobia, xenophobia, ableism, et cetera, right? So if you're not white, straight, Christian, able-bodied, cisgender man, then you've likely experienced some form of oppression. But if you exist at the intersection of multiple forms of oppression, then you've likely experienced remarkable barriers to inclusion and belonging. And that's what I wanna get at today in this presentation. Uh, the second point is that it's not just that our campuses only recently struggle with issues of diversity and inclusion. We heard it in the previous presentation. Many of you know from my history buffs in the room, uh, that many of the institutions that we work at were founded literally on land that was taken from Native and Indigenous communities to educate white wealthy clergymen. 
What does that have to do with belonging? Well, when Native and Indigenous communities are arguing for land acknowledgments, it's literally the least that we can do. That is to acknowledge that there have been concerted efforts that have literally conspired in their erasure. And at the core of that request for acknowledgement is uh, a declaration that we too belong to this space. Uh, or when black students are protesting names on statutes, names of buildings that honor white men who have ties to slavery in the Confederacy, they too are raising questions that I think get at the essence of what does it mean to belong to a place that doesn't seem to respect or value your cultural racial identities. The third point is that these factors shape the campus culture, the climate, how we do things in higher education, whose culture is valued, whose is not. Uh, and the other problem is that most of our student success approaches in higher education are predicated on this idea that in order for students to be successful in our campus, they have to integrate academically and socially, AKA assimilation, right? Into these white normed environments, severing ties with their native and indigenous communities in order to be successful. In fact, most belonging strategies and interventions are predicated on this idea that in order for students to be successful, they have to uh, sort of convince them that they belong to these places that have not uh, demonstrated that they belong in this campus. So that's the essence of what I wanna get at in this presentation. And this requires uh, a shift in mindset, moving away from what I call deficit mindsets to more equity oriented mindsets. So those who operate from deficit mindsets tend to do things like the following. Certainly no one in this room, folks they don't come to conferences like this, right? Uh, but folks who operate from an equity mindset tend to do things like the following. They privilege the academic culture uh, and view inconsistencies uh, between home and campus culture as student deficiencies. What do I mean by that? We know that some students come to our campus with fundamentally different ways of knowing and being that are at odds with the dominant culture at the institution, right? Some students come from more collectivist orientations, but when you get to higher education, we prioritize individualism and you know, independent assignments, right? Educators who see you know, that as sort of a deficient and the students have to kind of acquiesce, they see that as a form of deficit-minded perspective. The second point is that Educators who operate from a deficit-minded perspective tend to do, uh, view narrow, have narrow views of who can and can't learn based on dominant uh, and cultural stereotypes. These are folks who are not coming to conferences like this. They haven't done the hard work to unlearn what they've been socialized to believe about communities of color, about underrepresented populations, and so forth. The third point uh, that I want to mention is that deficit-minded educators tend to not see the value in finding alternative ways to engage students, right? These are the folks who teach chemistry 101 and say, I've been teaching this class 40 years, there's only one way to teach it. If students don't learn, if they're not engaged, it's because they don't care about education, right? How many of us heard people say things like that, right? Those are people who are operating from deficit-minded perspectives. Equity-minded educators do something completely different. One, they recognize how higher education is uh, normed on Eurocentric values uh, and that how larger social forces and oppressive forces shape how students experience the campus uh, and ultimately their outcomes. They also routinely assess their practices uh, to ensure that they're meeting the needs of students. So do we collect data? We just heard about the importance of moving beyond the asterisk that creates invisibility for Native and Indigenous students and making sure that we collect data that we can see our students in their fullness so that we can support them in their success. They also feel a personal and professional responsibility to ensure the success of their students. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that to accept personal responsibility. And then finally, educators who operate from a equity-minded perspective uh, are race and intersectionally conscious, right? They don't purport not to see race. In fact, they recognize that seeing students their identities and in their fullness is how we best support them and how we tailor support services in ways to increase their success. Uh, so what is sense of belonging, right? Many of you have titles that include belonging as part of it. Many of you have uh, work in offices and units that include that language. How many of you have belonging as part of a title or office unit that you work for or value, et cetera, right? So sense of belonging is one of those terms that have literally infiltrated the higher education lexicon. We use it so often and so frequently that I think sometimes we take for granted what it actually means. Uh, so I wanna uh, clarify that. Um, 
So I draw on the work of Terrell Strayhorn, who was my dear friend, mentor, uh, and doctoral advisor, who I know gave this keynote several years ago. Uh, and he talks about it as a psychological assessment of one's place or fit within the group. It's a feeling or sensation of being connected to, being a part of, feeling respected, valued by, and important to a group or community. What we also know from research is that uh, belonging is a cognitive assessment. So I make a determination about whether or not I fit in, in this sort of environment. When, and that engenders an affective response. So as a result, I may feel alienated. As a result, I may feel lonely. But it can also engender a behavioral response. So as a result, I may disengage. So some educators in the classroom wrongly interpret students' disengagement from the classroom as a sign that they don't care about education. Uh, is it that they don't care, or is it that we haven't created the conditions in the classroom such that they belong and feel compelled to be engaged in the environment? So an equity-minded sort of refrain. The other thing that we know uh, about belonging is that it's a basic human need. What do I mean by that? All people, regardless of who you are, your identities, we long and desire to find places and spaces where we belong. Uh, and motivational psychologists also argue that beyond sort of being a psychological phenomenon, our desire to belong is very deep in the neuro and peripheral biological level. That's a fancy way of saying that we are predisposed biologically to feel like we belong, to feel like we can identify spaces that align with our identities. The other thing uh, that I want to acknowledge is that our desire to belong takes on heightened importance in social contexts where our identities are marginalized. Think about LGBT students in largely heteronormative contexts. Think about women in STEM. Think about racial ethnic minority students in largely uh, white spaces. Think about adult learners in largely traditionally aged student populations. Think about disabled students in largely uh, ableist sorts of environments. So our desire to belong, it, it takes on increased importance in spaces where our identities are likely to be marginalized. So many of you have likely seen this pyramid before. If you took Maslow, if you took Psychology 101, you learned about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And in the spirit of decolonizing knowledge, I want to just recognize that there's lots of evidence to suggest that Maslow borrowed heavily on the native and indigenous contributions of the Blackfoot community. So uh, without proper attribution, what we sometimes in the academy call plagiarism. So I want to just acknowledge that <laughs> at the beginning, uh, the native and indigenous contributions to psychology. But what Maslow argues is that we all have human needs that we're motivated to meet in social context, right? And as lower order needs are met, higher order needs emerge. Now, there's lots of debates for my psychology folks in here about the, whether or not it sort of emerges in this hierarchical, uh, linear fashion. Um, but there's general agreement that these are the sort of basic human needs that we're all motivated to meet. And what Strayhorn argues is that essentially, if you look at any mission statement of a campus and university, you'll see similar language around self-actualization, morality, uh, developing students who experience purpose, right? That, 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 that's sort of in alignment with what the purpose of our institutions is. What I love about the illustration is that it shows that what stands directly in the middle of our ability to be able to meet our educational mission is the extent to which we can facilitate opportunities for students to experience love and belongingness. What we also see in this illustration is that what, you know, um, a precursor to belonging is physiological needs, safety, and security. It's hard to feel like you belong in a space when you're preoccupied with concerns about basic needs and security. It's hard to feel like you belong in a space when you're concerned about physical and psychological safety. Think about how important the basic uh, needs and security movement has been. Roughly a third of students in the country experience housing insecurity, food insecurity. Um, think about how important the Me Too movement has been for bringing attention to violence against women. Think about how important Title IX movement has been, violence on campus against women, people of color, LGBT students. It's hard to belong when you're preoccupied with these concerns. So when I speak to institutional leaders all the time, I tell them if we want to care, if we care about belonging, we also have to focus on these sort of precursors to belonging, what we call correlates to belonging. So a few other insights from research, uh, some of which is my own. Generally, we know that on average, uh, students of color report significantly lower levels of belonging. Same is true for first-generation students in comparison to their non-first-generation peers. 
The other thing that we know is when students feel a sense of belonging, they're more likely to persist towards their academic goals. They're more likely to feel uh, that they're ready to engage in the academic and social spheres of campus. They're more likely to feel a sense of well-being. For those who work in development, they're more likely to give back and participate as alumni. Um, the other point that I want to mention is that belonging is context dependent and must be satisfied as conditions change, right? So just because I belong right now in this moment don't mean I'll belong tomorrow. Things happen, things change, it's a variable. Um, the other thing is that I may belong to my campus club or organization, but in the classroom I may not feel like I belong. So we're constantly sort of counteracting where students belong and don't belong. And so I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a minute. Uh, but what I have been arguing in some of the more recent work that I've been doing uh, is that belonging is a social ecological construct that's shaped by multiple factors across the campus environment. So those that are close, like interactions, and those that are more distal, like cultural norms and other events and policies and so forth. Let me give you another example. So students are nested within various ecological campus uh, contexts on our campus that simultaneously influence their learning element. So we talk about the microsystem being the, the, it, the, the places where students experience direct interactions. So certainly the classroom, uh, the, the residence hall, their job, these are, these are the social interactions that students have. But when we go out further to the exosystem, these are things that happen outside of the students our institutional policies that impact students. At the macro system, what are the, what are the broader sort of cultural norms of society? All of that impacts. I did a paper with Terrell recently uh, where we studied the impact of Black Lives Matter protests on students belonging in STEM. And you may not be surprised to learn that what happens outside of the university shapes whether or not students belong on campus. Some folks are privileged to come to campus every day and not think twice about what happens in the world. I remember when I was in the faculty at Penn State, Coming, uh, going to a faculty meeting the day after the George Floyd murder and no recognition, no acknowledgement of what happened in the world, right? Some folks are privileged to come back to campus every day with no consideration of what happens in the world. So we have to be cognizant of what's happening and, and, and sort of affirming that how that impacts students in their success. One easier, less complex way of seeing this is through the individual interpersonal uh, and institutional levels. Too often we focus on the individual level that is trying to change students and not structures. We know that complex problems uh, require complex solutions and multi-level solutions. And our approaches and our practices must be aligned with an equity-minded paradigm. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I wanna be clear before I go to the next slide. It is not the responsibility of students to find a sense of belonging on this space. It is our responsibility to create conditions in which students belong, to root out racism, to root out problematic sort of ideologies and practices that get in the way of them belonging. Thank you. So at the individual level, right, what we know from research that if we build self-efficacy in students, if students feel efficacious about their abilities to do a task, they're more likely to feel like they belong. If they are academically motivated, they have coping skills to navigate social adversity on campus, they're more likely to feel like they belong. So yes, we should be thinking about how do we develop and nurture these things, but we should also be thinking about how their experiences on campus undermine their self-efficacy, undermine their motivation. So is it the case that students don't wanna be involved and engaged on campus, or is it that the, the campus robs them of their motivation to be involved on campus? The other point uh, is at the interpersonal level. We know that positive interactions and relationships with a wide array of people on campus increases and fosters belonging whether it be faculty, staff, uh, and peers, especially when you're interacting across race. Uh, so yes, we should be thinking about how do we get students engaged in the academic and social spheres of campus, but how are we preparing faculty, staff, students, especially those who are white, to interact and collaborate with minoritized students across race, across gender, across sexual orientation, across other sort of marginalized identities so they're not reducing belonging for students. And then finally, at the institutional level, um, I know this is a diversity conference, and diversity is important, and, but it's not uh, sufficient for changing institutional structures. So diversity and inclusion are important, but we have to move beyond it 
and center equity as part of that conversation as well. And when we center equity, we began to take stock of the institutional structures that impact belonging. So yes, we should be investing in campus programming aimed at awareness uh, around cultural and racial diversity, speaker series, cultural celebrations, identity-based groups, and so all of those things are important. Uh, but they're not sufficient for addressing the institutional structures that make those programs important in the first place. Uh, in the new work that I've been engaged in, I have been writing about something that I have coined as structural belonging. So moving beyond belonging from this sort of idea that we have to help convince students that they belong to these environments that haven't done much to demonstrate that they belong to a structural perspective on it. And that is referring to uh, the institutional conditions, policies, practices, uh, and cultural norms at our institution that demonstrate, not just tell students, that they belong, that they accept it, they're supported by um, the campus community. So I wanna offer some ideas about how I'm thinking about structural belonging. So in terms of campus design, right? We know campus design is important and there are folks who make lots of money to think about the construction of our campus environments. But are we designing our campuses in ways that demonstrate to students that they belong? Is it accessible? How can you belong to a place that you can't fully access, right? I remember being a student at the University of Illinois uh, in undergrad and we had the Black Cultural Center that was not accessible. There are tons of black students across campus who use wheelchairs, but who could not access the building because of the, the sort of building was built in the early 1900s, never was designed to be accessible. How is it that you can belong to a place uh, and not fully experience it and access. So we have to think about whether or not students have full access uh, to experience it. What does it mean to walk down the halls of buildings and never see your race or gender represented in the pictures? Many of us work in buildings like that, right? Or the name on buildings and statues, whose culture is centered, whose is not. Um, so we have to give some thought to how we physically design and structure institutions uh, in ways that signal to students that they belong. The other point uh, is around organizational and cultural norms. What are the norms on our campus environment? And what message does it send to students about their place and fit in the environment? If we have offices on campus that are organized as bureaucracies, and it takes a student to talk to five different people across three different offices to ask one question, how is that communicating to students that they belong? When we create seamless processes and decode uh, the language, we use language in higher education that is so outdated. What's a Burstar office, right? So if students don't even understand the language of higher education, how can they belong? What are the cultural norms, the language that we use in higher ed to make sure that students have opportunities to experience belonging? So when we streamline our services and make it easy for students to reconcile their issues and you know, navigate various aspects, we are promoting belonging. We ought to take stock of the implicit and explicit messages that students receive consistently uh, and what that communicates to them about their place and fit, uh, especially for those who are racially minoritized. The other point uh, is around curriculum reform. So we know the classroom is a really important site for learning, obviously, but it's also a site for marginalization and exclusion for so many students uh, because of the ways in which our curriculum has been, one, heteronormative, uh, ableist at times, uh, so, sort of white male dominated, uh, how do, when we create structural belonging, we advocate for curriculum standards and learning outcomes and academic programs that center power. Regardless of what your academic program, are students learning about power and difference and intersectionality and how that impacts, regardless of the discipline, the topic that they're studying? Uh, I remember years ago, I gave a talk and I was doing a, a a lesson around culturally relevant curriculum. And someone, a faculty member in a, a field I will not mention, was teaching a class about water filtration. And he said, how do I teach about water filtration in a culturally relevant way? There's only one way to teach about this. I said, have you ever heard of Flint, Michigan? Right? <laughs> what happened, when we connect our curriculum to examples where students can see their community, see themselves reflected in it, 
That's how we're creating opportunities for students to experience structural belonging. What expectations do we set for faculty to center diverse voices and experiences? I've done equity-minded syllabi review for faculty members. And they've, been, they've always have sort of these revelatory moments where they, I didn't know that the tone of my syllabus communicated this very authoritative sort of perspective that was demoralizing for some students. I remember being a, a political science student uh, at the University of Illinois, and on the first day of class, the professor had her stand up, and then 75% of us sit down and said, this is the percentage of you all who will drop the class before finishing it, right? What messages do we send to students about their belongingness, their place and fit within the classroom when we do things like that? Um, and are we working with faculty to design their course syllabi and other uh, course materials in equity-minded ways? The other point I want to mention is policy enactment and interpre uh, interpretation. Are we doing so in inter intersectional ways? When we're making policy decisions that impact students, in what ways are their voices centered? Who made the policy about parking on campus being <laughs> paid, right? Student voice wasn't involved in that, I assure you, right? Uh, especially those who are minoritized. What lenses do we use? When we are making institutional decision making, I have a colleague at um, Penn State University who's coined this idea of critical legal consciousness, that the law sometimes is a way that we use to sort of discourage folks from making decisions that we know are right, right? What, what, what critical lenses are we bringing to our interpretation of policies that impact minoritized students? Uh, and then second, are we routinely auditing our policies and practices? and looking at the disparate effects for minoritized communities by making sure that we serve those at the margins of margins, we better serve all students, uh, to quote Dean Spade, uh, with the idea of sort of trickle up activism. And then the last point uh, that I wanna mention is around personal responsibility. Do we accept here today personal responsibility for the success of our students on campus and work within our spheres of influence on campus to promote equity? How are we investing in our own professional learning and development? I always say, you know, increasing our racial equity literacy is so important, right? Uh, I think about racial equity literacy in three ways. One, building the knowledge and awareness around race and racism and systems of oppression so that we can recognize racial moments when they happen. One of the key things that I think lots of institutional leaders do wrong when racism happen and other kinds of conflict happen on campus is that they can't recognize and name it for what it is, right? That is demoralizing for minoritized communities. The second thing that they do wrong is not having the sort of emotional competencies to be able to manage the uncomfortable moment, right? So sometimes while when we don't engage in racial conflict or moments when they happen on campus, because it's uncomfortable, right? So do we have the emotional sort of strength and fortitude to manage that moment? And third, do we have the skill sets to intervene have we practiced in these sorts of spaces and case studies and examples of when this situation happens, what do we do? Can I recognize the moment? Do I have the emotional fortitude to manage it? And do I have the skill sets to intervene and do something about it? Um, that's what racial equity literacy is. With that, I'm gonna stop. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. You've already seen the, the book uh, outside. Feel free to get a copy. It's an excellent resource, I think, for those who are Committed to racial equity, it models, I think, the kind of collaboration among researchers and practitioners that are necessary to be effective in advancing it. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Now, this is your opportunity to ask Dr. Johnson any questions that you have. We have two microphones. You can come up. This is one and the other one. I am an educator, so I'm used to silence for a minute, so <laughs> no worries. <laughs> sure. Yes, Nicole. many different levels of institutions, whether that be research institutions or teaching institutions. I'm a former cheerleader, so me and the mic. Um, <laughs> but I think, I'm wondering the research and the practice, because often 
you know, there's isolated research on quote unquote DEI work versus uh, scholarships by specialists in the fields that were the large prism of DEI work over intersects and overlaps. Absolutely. So I'm wondering if you could give, you know, audience members who are here at different levels, different points of action, um, say for a, a student level, faculty level, administrative level, and then staff levels of how do they raise consciousness in space, even if they may not be in the direct position to change structures? How, how would their advocacy help them kind of move the needle in structural mm -hmm. change? Well, let me go to the first point that you mentioned. You know, one of the premises of the book was that researchers can, sometimes can be arrogant, right? And that we think we, we come up with questions that we think are important to study. And sometimes that research is not always grounded in the practical realities of those who work on the ground to advance practice, right? So what we wanted to do was uh, push back against those power asymmetries and center practitioners in this work and say, that you work on the ground, what are the topics that we should be studying? What are the issues impacting racial equity? What are the questions that you think we need to be focused on in order to really move the needle? And so this, this is how this sort of book came about. For those of you who work in various sorts of positions and have different, uh, depending on your identity, depending on your positional power and authority, there are different things that we have to, um, to take into consideration. One of the things my doctoral advisor, Terrell Strayhorn, told me years ago is that you have to, for, especially for folks of color, that you know, not every issue is a stand on the table issue. But when you get to those stand on the table issues, you ought to be ready to break the table. And it was useful for me when I was starting my career because I felt exhausted, always constantly intervening to address the racial inequities in a room, whether it was a faculty search committee, whether it was in the classroom, and the protecting my students of color from harm in the classroom or outside of the classroom, it is exhausting to do that. So one, I think you have to take care of yourself first. Put the oxygen mask on first. The other thing that I think is important to do, regardless of what your um, sort of position is, is to identify who are the equity advocates within the ecosystem of where you work. Who are, the, you know, folks like the idea of the meeting before the meeting, right? Sometimes we have to go in with in preparation and coalition, coalition building and having conversations before the meeting so that we are strategizing and feel uh, sort of fortified to move an agenda forward. Um, for those of you lead offices, you know, one of the easy things that I think, you know, developing a shared language and vocabulary around race, racial equity, diversity, what do these terms mean? We use them in our offices all the time, but oftentimes everyone does not have the same sort of playing field in doing that. One recommendation I always have for folks who lead offices is, you know, uh, come up with a glossary list of words and terminologies that animate the work that we do. I've heard and spoke to some folks already about uh, reading. So Terrell and I lead the uh, Promising Places to Work in Student Affairs, National Recognition Through Diverse Issues uh, in ACPA, where we uh, sort of recognize institutions who are exemplars in advancing um, student affairs workplaces that are humanizing and diverse and inclusion. And one of the things that we learned uh, from studying these campus environments is that some folks have entire onboarding and orientations that center around diversity and equity issues. How are we onboarding people on our teams to, uh, to be effective in carrying out diversity work? They had entire reading lists and uh, syllabi essentially to work in a particular office. So one, identify your equity advocates across your unit, uh, work within your sphere of influence, whether it be in the classroom with other faculty members, um, when I was at Penn State, I helped organize what we called the Equity Pedagogy Network. Um, and we helped faculty organize in communities of practice to commit to learning about issues of diversity, and equity, and inclusion, and help them come up with resources in order to advance their learning. Partner with researchers and scholars who uh, do work on these areas to bring research, to introduce research uh, in those meetings. Those are some initial ideas. Thank you for the question. This is embarrassing. I didn't know I'd be asked to come up here. <laughs> okay, a very simple question. When we speak of assimilation, you know, it's been seen more and more in a negative context. How can we change it to being more positive? I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I see the positive in it. Um, I, I think it depends on the context, right? I mean, I think there are, there are habits of mind and 
strategies for being an effective and productive student that we want our students to assimilate into and learn, right? So in that sense, but I use assimilation in the sense of a broader sort of cultural uh, concern that many of our institutions are normed on the dominant or majority group. And so for students who come from backgrounds that are not that, it can feel uh, marginalizing to feel like I can't bring my full self to this campus environment. And in order for me to be successful in this environment, I have to give up a part of myself. In fact, the uh, Vincent Tinto, who sort of uh, pioneered the work around student retention, his uh, popular model around retention uh, is sort of organized around academic and social integration. Well, one, where does that language integration come from? Well, we're in the place of Brown v. Board, right? The idea of what it means to integrate in places that weren't designed for you. I think we have to move away from that idea. So I speak about you know, assimilation in that, in that sense. Uh, maybe there are some more positive aspects to uh, assimilation in a different sense in terms of like learning what it means to be in a, a productive uh, student in a context. That that's, a, that's, that's something you, you, we want students to um, adopt. But in the cultural sense, I think we have to create environments that are um, open, inclusive, and welcoming to the wide range of cultural orientations uh, that students have versus telling students they have to give up an aspect of themselves uh, to be uh, successful in this environment. I hope that answered your question. Sorry. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was so excited to hear you centering basic needs uh, as, as critical to student sense of belonging. I advise the food pantry here on campus. And I wonder if you have suggestions for ways that institutions can further center basic needs and support the work of institutionalizing that. Because I think in some ways it's challenging for institutions, uh, you know, like Washburn, who uh, oh. really center their accessibility to everyone to then say, our students are hungry and we need to solve that problem before we can help them with math or science or Absolutely. anthropology. Thank you for the question. Uh, so the Hope Center at Temple University uh, in Philadelphia has done amazing work around basic needs and security. Uh, and much of it has brought awareness to the prevalence of basic needs and security, especially prevalent at community colleges. Um, you know, there are a couple of things that I think we can do. One. In my course syllabi, I include statements and language about if students are experiencing a basic need and security, one, feel comfortable to reach out to me. Uh, and here are some other resources on campus. We take for granted what it means to show up to a class, I actually just learned uh, that a student I was working with uh, who had no indication at all had been homeless for six months, had no clue. Meeting with him every other week on Zoom from public spaces, had no idea. So we can't take for granted that some students show up on our spaces in the classroom uh, without sort of adequate resources to be successful. Uh, so the course syllabi is one way to communicate support. But from a more institutional perspective, um, I think we have to partner with social services more. Uh, and the Hope Center offers some resources about how to do this. You know, one, are we part, do we know about how to get students connected to EBT and food? Um, resources, food stamps, and so forth to be able to support um, their food insecurities. Are we uh, partnering with local housing authorities to know what kinds of housing vouchers and resources we can provide students? You know, I do work on young people in foster care. And one of the things that we learned when at the height of COVID, when we closed our university campuses, we created this enormous basic need and security for students who had no permanent residence to go home to, right? So some of it is raising our own sort of institutional and personal consciousness around it, that when we make institutional decisions, we, we're, we're sort of um, centering those who might not be represented. So partnering with social services, thinking about how do we um, convey support in the classroom um, are, are some initial ways. One, do we collect information and data about the prevalence of basic needs and security on our campus for those who are in assessment offices or you know, lead um, research for the campus? Do we have measures and proxies to even ask questions about whether or not students are experiencing these things. It's hard to address it if we're not collecting information. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so it's loud. So, I'm so glad you touched uh, on uh, social services. 
I frequently um, get called on from the community to help uh, various uh, people with Muslim or Arabic background or you know just Muslim background struggling with from everything domestic abuse to um, needing um, shelters or um, recently I found myself very frustrated with the community I'm, I'm sorry I called a lot of community uh, uh, you know I'm not going to name names, but many of them, and I just faced obstacles. And so to my surprise, I um, thought about calling a faculty member here, uh, Dr. Sharon Sullivan. I don't know if she's here, but she really saved the day. She had a lot of connections, and she um, opened the way for me to get to speak to um, administrators at the agencies, and I was able to help this one person. Uh, it took a lot of time. It took about two weeks before I was able to really um, get her real help. And it, it was finally a success. Mm -hmm. But it's frustrating sometimes to uh, help people in the community if we don't have the know-how or a connection how to get to, to the people we need to. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment. Hi, so I'm an educator and I'm in the classroom right now with a small group. I have two middle-aged men of color and five traditional female college students. Mm -hmm. And the issues that come up in the classroom stem from an absolute lived experience uh, to the very beginnings of understanding the issues of racism. And I wondered if you would speak to educators as to how to bridge that gap in a way that doesn't shut down those who starting this journey mm -hmm. because I notice when you come in with those terms right away like racism which is certainly the elephant in the room it shuts down the learning and you know I've read the books I'm coming to the conferences I'm trying to educate myself with my own privilege but also recognizing that students don't do this right off the bat and so I wondered if you could speak to that this is uh, if you restate the question um, for educators who are working with students who may be um, reluctant to engage in the material? Yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you. You know, I had a really traumatizing experience a couple years ago with a student who was really defiant in the classroom and who um, harassed me, quite frankly, and harassed me inside and outside of the class, in part because of the content that I was teaching and their unreadiness to engage the material. Um, you know, one, edu as educators, we have to feel comfortable and safe in the classroom to engage the material. Uh, and then it's also thinking about how do we create classroom environments that are safe. Um, you know, one thing that I do at the beginning of a classroom is that we establish the, the norms, the classroom norms uh, for students. What is our approach for intervening when a community member in the classroom says something that is offensive? What, what is the sort of protocol for doing so? So we try to do that early on uh, in the classroom to, and then, you know, rapport and building trust and role modeling for students how to intervene, how to sort of uh, navigate conflict in the classroom is one way I think that you allow folks to sort of disarm themselves to feel more comfortable and engaging. But the challenge is that when something harmful does happen in the classroom, and it's, it's hard to bounce back from, uh, and that was what happened in my classroom. And actually, in another class, when I was a student, I remember um, a, the faculty member saying something that one of the students found offensive. And no one was sort of, no one caught it because no one had ever heard that term uh, in that sort of way. And it just derailed the entire classroom. The professor had no sort of protocol for bringing it back. So one, I think rapport is important and uh, trust building. I think coming up with uh, established norms. Many of us, when we design classrooms, we say things like in our statements that we co-construct the classroom with students. But in what ways do we really do that, right? Do, what ways do we invite students to help design what their learning experience is and position them as agents uh, to be able to do so. So I think by establishing shared cultural norms, uh, having protocols uh, and strategies for when things go awry uh, are, are some ways in which we move to a direction where students feel comfortable embracing difficult topics. Um, hope that's useful. 
Hey, thank you um, very much for this opportunity. My name is Mercy Umeri, Wichita State University. So I wanted to ask for, um, say an advice for a new faculty member who um, is joining a team in a school that is about 50 years old. So I am um, in, a, in a school that is about 50 years old today. And as the first woman of color in that you know, school, how do you, you know, you talked about equity advocates. How do you bring in other faculty members to be equity advocates where the burden of DEI is not always on you as the only person of color in that school? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I, when I was at Penn State, I was the one of two black men faculty members among 250 plus faculty in the college and experienced the heightened sort of um, presentation in, the, in, in it and felt an enormous responsibility um, for to do DEI sorts of things. Um, one of the things that I did, one, I, I, I had uh, faculty colleagues who signaled support and white colleagues of power to full professors and other senior level colleagues who wanted to support me. And I remember an instance where um, someone said something really offensive in a faculty member uh, in a meeting and I didn't address it in that moment because I like most folks of color in some of these spaces when you're experiencing these things, there is a physical and psychological toll of the accumulation of racial microaggressions that happen what uh, Walter Smith talks about is racial battle fatigue. We get tired of having to navigate these sorts of spaces. And my white senior colleague um, came up to me afterwards, a uh, mentor, and said, I just want to check on you and ask if you're okay. And I said, don't check on me now. You miss the opportunity in the moment to support. You know, you position yourself as an ally and as a supporter of me. Don't miss, the, that was your moment. Show me, don't tell me. And so I say for folks who want to be allies and who want to support their colleagues, their colleagues of color, especially and others who have minoritized identities, don't miss the moment to show up. Now, certainly I have agency and folks of color have agency to make decisions about how we want to intervene and who we want to speak on our behalf. But in instances like that, uh, it was an educational moment um, for me. I, some, I have, sometimes we have to help educate people on how to support us. And, and how to show up for us. And that was a moment that I had to do that. Um, you know, find, and, and she is, she, was an, she is an amazing equity advocate and supporter of me to this day. Um, but it, it took time for me to help educate her on how best to support me in those spaces. So as you figure out who's within your ecosystem in the, the college or university, um, through relationship building, you help educate people on how to, uh, how to show up and support and with the strategy behind it. I hope that's helpful. Uh, it's, it's hard to be in spaces and places where you're the only. Um, and sometimes we have to make, um, have a care protocol for ourselves. And that, you know, that, that we take a step back sometimes because it can be really exhausting and find the places and spaces across campus that nurture you. For some, for me, that was finding, I talked to someone about this the other day, um, and that was me finding my colleagues in African-American studies and finding my folks in gender women's studies who I could talk to and commiserate about some of the issues that I could have and to, to, to I didn't and strategize about the supports about how to navigate the space. Thank you for the question. Hello. Oh, there we go. All right. How you doing? Um, I'm Zachariah Harris. I'm the director of campus life at Highland Community College. Um, I, don't, wait, I don't, do you know where Highland is at? I do not. Oh, all right. <laughs> Highland is a very small, very small community college. Um, I've been in Kansas for five years and I still don't know where it's at, but that's <laughs> a different story. Um, so, while the students are enrolled at Highland, the population of the city goes up to 1,000. When the students leave for summer, the population drops down to about 700, 740, 740 wow. people. So very rural, very small. 
being a director of Campus Life, um, I, I came in, person before me didn't really do a lot to help the students, wasn't, you know, we were, there weren't a lot of resources available, the, or actually the resources were available, but they weren't being used. So coming in, I am, you know, really getting things moving again. Uh, I haven't, <laughs> haven't made friends with everybody, but hey, that comes with the position. Um, my question for you is, well, actually, I want to paint the picture so you can answer it real good. Um, being here at the, 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 this conference, it's really been amazing. Uh, yesterday, sat down in a few caucuses and get made you know a lot of connections. Uh, really talked to you know the different ones at the different universities that will allow me to begin to build the student the student groups up at the campus. Um, again, it's Highland. Uh, we have a gas station and a restaurant. Uh, the closest Walmart is 20 minutes away, so that's again tiny, tiny. It's, Ah, oh, so sad. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so Walmart or yeah, shuttle trips to Walmart. Uh, just got the food pantry up and running again. Um, what else happened? The food pantry, Walmart. Um, goodness, it's I, I got a lot going. Excuse me. But anyway, so with the connections that I made here at the conference. I'm going to use those resources because, as you know, it's not what you know, but who. Right. So in who I know, using those resources to get students outside of Highland, get them to, the, you know, the big here, Washburn, KU, uh, you know, maybe some other, you know, community colleges as well. So, again, have a multiple, well, since coming here, have multiple resources, have really a lot of really good information and really got, you know, a, good, a lot of momentum going back to Highland. So my question is, what other resources or what other steps would you recommend taking toward bringing life back to Highland? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. I think this is a wonderful space among many other spaces that exist nationally. Um, I, certainly, have you ever heard of National Conference on Race and Ethnicity, INCOR? How many of you go to INCOR have heard of INCOR? It's an amazing space, uh, I see some hands jumping up, um, to also find folks who are equally committed to bringing back uh, what they learn to their um, respective campuses. Um, you know, there are lots of other associations, ACPA, NASPA, that provide similar spaces like this to find folks who are in your similar kinds of roles, too, uh, to be among communities of practice. There's the um, Student Affairs Listserv. I can't think of the name of it. I'll, I'll connect it with you afterwards. But I think it's like finding your people nationally and locally, too. Folks who do the kind of work that you do, who you can connect with. Um, uh, share strategies with, there are lots of, I work at the USC Race and Equity Center also, uh, led by Sean Harper, who um, does wonderful professional learning experiences all the time about race and racism. That's an institute that's available. Um, but yeah, I can connect with you afterwards to share additional resources uh, as well in spaces um, that may be helpful. Last question. Mm -hmm. OK. So good morning. I'm Glenda Washington. I'm with the Chamber of Commerce here, the Greater Topeka Partnership, the Economic Development Entity. So I'm the Chief Equity and Opportunity Officer. I want to reply to the young lady that had the experience that mm. she thought uh, wasn't becoming of our community. I apologize to you for that. How are you? I apologize to you for that. But we have to take ownership as well. We, as um, leaders in our communities, have to find out the, what the need is before the need occurs. Um, it took you two weeks to get around to getting the right person. Uh, we have to take responsibility on our campuses. There are individuals on our campuses that are suffering, that are in need. Find out before they need it, before they break down, before that thing happens, where those resources are. Uh, we should make those connections. A lot of times, campuses um, divide themselves from the community, and it's hard to get in the door. Don't divide yourself from your community. Don't take um, a back seat. Come into your community with questions. Seek the answers, because you're responsible for somebody's child now. So seek the answers. Find out what the needs are going to be. Identify those resources beforehand, 
And if you can't do it, somebody in administration can. We interact with Washburn all of the time. And there's no reason that you could not find what you needed with one phone call. The one point that I want to amplify that was mentioned is that, listen, you, the, folks are doing lots of research on these topics, but you don't need research in order to address issues. You don't need to hire me to do a campus climate survey to know that there's an issue on your campus with climate, right? You don't need to hire me to, to do a study about how students are experiencing basic needs. We should assume already that students are experienced and do, and do something about it. So, um, you know, t certainly there's tons of research and uh, that's available, but we don't need that insight in order to act now uh, and to hold folks accountable for doing it. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I hope you all have a wonderful conference. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. He will be around until just after lunch, and then he's got a plane to catch and classes to teach in Singapore. So if you want to have, ask him a question, you'll have to do it here in the next hour or so. It's about 10.15. We are right on time. Your next sessions are going to start at 10.30. And we've structured the conference so that the sessions take place in three buildings. Most of the sessions are in the conference rooms, one floor above this, this floor of this building. There are five sessions that are just across the way in the Bradbury Thompson Alumni Center. And there is one session that is in our Rita Blick Gallery that is adjacent to White Concert Hall. So you have campus maps with your programs, and if you, again, if you have any questions locating or finding your next session, those of us with the Washburn name tags are happy to help. Restrooms are just at the end of, south end of this hallway. Um, when we convene for lunch, we'll return to this room. Any other housekeeping items I've forgotten? CTEL, CTEL. So those of you who are Washburn faculty and you want to get credit for the Center for Teaching and Excellence and Learning badges, there are sign-in sheets in your rooms for you to sign in so that you can get CTEL credits. Thank you all.